This video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. Abraham Jebediah Abe Simpson II, or shall I say Grandpa, is Springfield's OG and perhaps owns the most interesting character arc out of anyone in the show. Now, a cliche with my videos is stating that a character has literally done it all, but with Grandpa, he really has. Or claims to have. Is that story true, Grandpa? Well, most of it. I did wear a dress for a period in the 40s. Almost all of Grandpa's biographical information is supplied by himself and sometimes seems completely made up, often as part of his waffling gag. And in those days, Nichols had pictures of bumblebees on him. And so suggesting that Grandpa really is quite senile, making him an awfully inaccurate autobiographer but also an awfully entertaining geezer too. So you've requested it and I'm providing it. Let's explore the complete timeline of Grandpa Simpson. I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh oh. Now I know you want to learn about Grandpa, but you don't actually want to be a Grandpa. So level up your streaming skills with Atlas VPN. Bored of the same old stuff on Netflix, Disney Plus and other streaming services and you don't want to pay for another subscription? Well, welcome Atlas VPN into your chill time is the zero effort key that unlocks a secret door to existing shows and movies hidden from you just because of where you live. For example, on Disney Plus in the US, you are blocked from accessing stars, holding Futurama, American Dad and Bob's Burgers. But with Atlas VPN, you simply click United Kingdom and Bob's your uncle. Right now, Atlas VPN is running a huge discount for Cyber Month. At last, something you do need. Basically, it's a three year subscription for just $1.39 a month. That's 86% off. And it's not just the price that makes them stand out either. The streaming speed is impeccable. You can protect all of your devices with just one subscription. It blocks ads, malware and protects your security. So don't be a homer, click our special link in the description and get access to Atlas VPN Cyber Month deal with 86% off and three extra months for free. Time's running out so go and get yours now. Grandpa's Early Life Now to nail down Grandpa's birth year is like asking what's inside a Krusty Burger. We just don't know. Hey, this is all about board. <laughs> Abraham Simpson was born on May 25th and raised in the old country, wherever that is. His great-great-grandfather Virgil was an escaped slave. Mabel Simpson helped Virgil escape from Colonel Burns and they fled to Canada. They got married and Virgil adopted her surname Simpson. Their son Abe was grandpa's great grandfather and his namesake. Anyway, when the boat docked in New York, Abe along with his family lived inside the Statue of Liberty. We had to move out once we'd filled the head with garbage. The end. His father was said to have been a professional child beater back in the day, which may explain the Simpsons trait of disciplining their young with violent methods. Are you little <laughs> Grandpa also claims to have served in World War I as a very young child, but this may have been one of Grandpa's fabricated stories. There are a few events like this that just don't correspond with other events and some that seem damn near impossible. But even so, this may explain how it provoked enough fear in him to try and avoid the army many years later. Grandpa's passion for music started with whistling as a child, but he blew all the ligaments in his lips, leading him on to having to pay other guys to kiss his girlfriends. It was a good deal. I'd pay for five minutes, but it would go on for hours. Grandpa as a young adult. Abe grew up and had many jobs, such as a professional grifter during the Great Depression. Yeah, in the Depression you had to grift. Either that or work. Which could explain why he was such a good darn salesperson when marketing Simpsons & Sons Revitalizing Tonic. Surprising, her revitalizing tonic! <sighs> 
As well as earning the coin, he was also earning medals, participating in the 1936 Summer Olympics, very nearly killing Hitler with a javelin. The next time I saw Hitler, we had dinner and laughed about it. When World War II broke out, Abe tried avoiding joining the army any way he could, even by posing as a lady to play within a women's baseball league in 1942. And he was pretty successful in avoiding the service for a whole year. But after an unfortunate mishap, he was found out. Get him! He could threaten my record for lady triples. Abe has a pretty confusing timeline, but do you know what's even more confusing? It's that only a small portion of you who watch my videos are actually subscribed to my channel. So go on, do me a favor and tap that sexy red button. It's free, you'll be helping me out, so cheers. Anyway, let's get back to the video. Abraham Simpson in the military. Grandpa first enlisted in the US Navy as a watch commander at Pearl Harbor in 1941 before the attack. He served on the ship USS World War I and acted heroically, surviving an attack by learning how to ride sharks. I still keep in touch with all those men and some of the sharks. After this, he joined the army where he became the sergeant of the Flying Hellfish, leading his unit during the Battle of the Bulge, an attempt to kill Hitler. And they very nearly succeeded too, if not for Charles Montgomery Burns. Little help? Abe Simpson was a natural born leader, a trait he'd passed down to his son Homer, albeit Homer does so in a less admirable and wholesome way, but you can't deny he can't rally up a crowd. While in Germany, the Hellfish unit uncovered priceless treasures and so made a pact between themselves that whoever is the last surviving member takes the treasure. On another mission, he gets separated from his platoon while parachuting into Dusseldorf. So he posed as a cabaret singer for a short period and during one memorable performance, he sang for Hitler where he accidentally outed himself. Ach du lieber, das ist not einer Bubi. Just before D-Day, he was stationed in the UK, and this is where he met Edwina. He shipped out soon afterwards, but he left a little piece of him behind. Homer's first half-sibling, Abby. Uh, well, gotta go. See you in heaven. Before the end of the war, Abe rejoined the Navy as a pilot and worked alongside his brother Cyrus. Cyrus? You never mentioned him before. And I'll never mention him again. Monty Burns also followed Abe into the Navy and was his tail gunner. During a Japanese kamikaze attack, his brother's plane was shot down and he was presumed dead. Abe and Monty were also shot down and crashed into the sea. They washed up ashore on an island where they remained stranded for months. During one Christmas Eve, a mysterious aircraft flew overhead and Burns shot it down. They chased down the wreckage and were shocked to find Santa. Donder! Blitzen! He's German. That's good eating. Together, they help rebuild his sleigh so he can deliver all the presents on time. But Naughty Burns knocks out Santa Claus with a coconut and steals the flying sleigh for himself. But Abe catches up to him on Prancer and takes him out with a tricycle. Somebody should have beat you with a tricycle years ago! <laughs> He then returns the sleigh to Santa, who promises to come back and rescue him, but Santa never returned, leaving Abe to claim that he invented jet skis made of coconuts and finally made it off the island. And then when I did, the war was over and the nurses were all kissed out. Ever since that day, Abe held a grudge against Santa for never coming back to collect him. Until decades later when Santa showed him and told him that his brother was alive and well, living on Tahiti with his 15 native wives. When Abe asks Santa why he never came back for him, he says, I kept putting it off and then I was just too embarrassed. Needless to say that the early years of Grandpa just feels like one long fever dream. But I'll let you decide what you think is true and what you believe to be false. After the war and life in the 1950s. Like many veterans, it seems that Abe felt lost after the war and so he agreed to model as an army man for just $50. 
Philip, his photographer, quite fancied the action man, and thinking Abe felt the same, he kissed him. But this shocked Abe so much that he fled in panic. As fast as he could. Later on in life, Abe would track his old photographer buddy down and discovered that the little kiss changed his life forever. He got the courage to leave his wife and be his true self. And he even made a living by making art of Abe. And just to check if he could swing both ways, Abe kissed him. Sorry, my friend. This army man is as straight as Gomer Pyle. <laughs> Anyway, cutting back to the past, Grandpa entered the world of professional wrestling as glamorous Godfrey, a charismatic heel famed for cheating and his vanity. But unknowingly, Mr. Burns was his biggest fan. This suggests that Abe, even in character, had traits Mr. Burns envied, even if unknowingly, which may reason why so many of Abe's troubles center around Mr. Burns and perhaps an underlying jealousy. But anyway, in the wrestling world, Abe wasn't so keen on playing the villain, hanging up his championship belt and boots for good. It was perhaps during this time that Grandpa wanted to feel a part of something again. Being part of a team in a platoon felt really right for him, and so he joined a whole bunch of societies, including the Stonecutters, the Elks, Communists, Masons. I'm the president of the Gay and Lesbian Alliance for some reason. His connection with the LGBTQ plus community at first seemed a bit random, but it may line up with his romance with Philip, awakening an empathy for their cause. Even though a member of countless groups, he yearned to be back in the action, and so re-enlisted in the 1950s, joining the Air Force. Keeping desert turtles off the runway! Shoo! Shoo now! Whilst there at a nearby bar, he met Mona for the first time, working as a cocktail waitress, and was pretty smitten. But not smitten enough to venture into a carnival nearby looking for some ladies. And during a wild and spontaneous game of Dunk the Clown, he creates yet another child, Herb Simpson. But after the literal fun and games, he heads back to the airbase to hijack a plane in a bid to impress Mona, breaking the sound barrier and the plane all at the same time. Ending with a proposition to Mona for her hand in marriage. I'm a sucker for reckless nitwits. Oh, Mona. Abe's marriage to Mona. Abe was happily married to Mona at first. They went on dates, danced, and he even got her name tattooed on his chest. Mona fell pregnant with Homer, her first son, but not Abe's. This was now his third child. How did he get that? Abe told Mona about Herb when Homer was born, and she made Grandpa swear never to tell Homer, believing it would make Homer disrespect his dad. We then learn that Mona cheated on Grandpa with a lifeguard during their marriage, so it's safe to say that she had a wandering eye for opportunity since the beginning, whether for a sexual conquest or for the pursuit of flower power. This is the hippie commune your mother ran off to when life with me became a living hell. Anyway, back to Abe, we learn that the little family of three lived in a small but sweet ranch house in the country with a dog named Bongo who Homer just loved. But no amount of picket fences and family-like idealism could heal the slow malfunction of his marriage, prompting arguments and fights. From years of the military service, leading platoons into battle and throwing javelins at bad guys, Grandpa naturally built up a stoic demeanor that melted into fatherhood. But nonetheless, he still acted lovingly towards his little boy, such as dressing up as Santa Claus and jingling his keys for his son's amusement. I love that little guy. What the heck you for? Later on, Abe's house was foreclosed, and so the family moved to a house in Springfield, but the move didn't heal Mona and Abe's marriage. It seems as though they did try and heal parts of their relationship, like in the summer of 1969, when they attended Woodstock together, but Abe hated the hippie lifestyle. But I want to play in the mud and be a hippie! Never! 
Even if in their humble beginnings it seemed as though they wanted the same thing, we could now see how they were so different. Mona was a free spirit wanting to learn and progress from the small town suburban wife lifestyle, and Abe was into swing dancing, sports and… well, not being a hippie. And so this led on to a bit of a divide. A painted model planes in the basement, probably as a way to relax, but when a young Homer wandered down to spend time with him, he was shouted at. And so Homer ran upstairs instead to bake with his mum, naturally causing a divide and a closer bond with his mum. During this time, they also attended weekly marriage counselling, where Homer once again was exposed to their troubles. Homer opens up to Abe about this on a fishing trip, and the father tells his son not to worry. But it seems as though there was something to worry about, as not too long after this, Mona leaves Abe and Homer behind. I had no clue! Life as a single father and grandpa steps up. When Mona protests a germ warfare lab owned by Mr. Burns and helps detonate a bomb killing all of his precious germs, she is forced to go on the run, and so leaves a message for Abe on some alcohol bottles. Instead of telling his son the truth, he tells little Homer that his mother has died. Ah, uh, she's dead. That ought to hold him. And that's what Homer believed for so many years, until she came back into his life as an adult. Mom? Homer? Very recently, in season 33, we got the episode Mother and Other Strangers. The episode retcons the beloved Mother Simpson episode, where Abe reveals that Homer's mother really is alive. Oh my god, I wasn't protecting you! I was protecting me! From the shame of a wife who left! And so, they go on a cross-country road trip to go and find her. I'm not really a fan of this retcon episode, but it does have a few cute moments between Homer and Abe. So I'll give it that. Say, boy, are you left-handed or right? Right. <gasps> I never knew that! After Mona left home, Abe worked as a busboy at a restaurant named Spyro's, writing songs and playing the piano, a callback to his love of music in his whistling career. He was so good, in fact, they caught the eye and attention of performer Rita Lafleur. The two made music together, fell in love, and soon got married. But on their wedding day, Rita gets a call about a big break, leaving for a year-long tour. They were going to leave all together as a family, but Abe decided it would be better if Homer and him stayed behind. But I'm all the family this boy's got. Perhaps providing some balance to Homer's turbulent childhood. Are you okay, Daddy? Well, of course I'm okay, I'm with you! It also seems that Abe has a running theme of women, leaving him for the window of opportunity, which I feel could be a reason why he may be so needy later on in life, in the fear that his family may leave him behind. I love you, son! Yeah, yeah. So that leaves father and son with their dog Bongo, but not for long as Bongo would leave too. One day, Bongo bit Mr. Burns, encouraging him to threaten the dog's little life. So Abe decided to take the dog to a safer home, protecting it from Mr. Burns, and perhaps his wardrobe of monstrosities. But Mr. Burns was not satisfied, and so got Abe to look after his ferocious hounds, also demanding Grandpa to wear his iconic bolo tie and slippers for the rest of his life, taking away the dignity he once owned as Mr. Burns' superior. But this still doesn't stop Homer resenting his father for getting rid of Bongo. Our relationship never recovered. Their relationship was never quite the same after this. As a struggling single father, Abe could be tough on his son and wasn't always the most supportive. When Homer wanted to compete in gymnastics, Grandpa sabotaged his performance, complaining that's what he got for believing in him. And then when Homer asks Abe for some advice on how to woo Marge, Abe criticizes him for aiming too high. Go for the dented car, the dead-end job, the less attractive girl. But despite this, when Marge fell pregnant with Bart, Grandpa pushes Homer to propose, and as a wedding gift, Grandpa gifts them all of his money. May not be much, but it's all I've got. 
and later sells his own house for Margin Homer to use it as a deposit for Evergreen Terrace. So how long before you ship Grandpa off to the old folks home? About three weeks. <laughs> When Bart came along, his relationship with Grandpa was a lot more relaxed than his relationship with Homer, which really grew when Bart went to live with Abe for a short while. When Bart was just six years old, he left his toy car out, injuring Homer as a result. And so they take Bart to live with Grandpa for a bit. Bart, still fixated on cars, pushes Grandpa to show him his gorgeous car that he bought back in 1954. And he even lets Bart drive it. Grandpa, I can't drive. Neither can I, legally. Now let's get going. Which reasons why Bart is such a good driver in Bart on the Road. Grandpa in the Present After fighting world wars, performing in the Olympics and raising a kid single-handedly, Grandpa is now living a quieter life at Springfield's Retirement Castle. And even though he basically gave Homer everything he owns, he is mostly ignored by his family. I had that dream again. Oh, thank God. It's only Grandpa. But hey, at least has a good time with Jasper. As I mentioned earlier, Abe has a very special bond with his grandson, Bart. When Grandpa tells him all about the flying hellfish treasure, Bart naturally doesn't believe him. And can you blame him? Abe has made some pretty outlandish claims in the past. Now, my story begins in 1962. But when Mr. Burns bursts in to steal Abe's key, Bart finally believes his grandpa. So they work together to get their prize for themselves. They find the treasure's location, but Burns shows up to steal it from them. He then kicks Bart into a safe where it falls into the sea. But heroic grandpa dives in to save him. Together, they stop Burns and Abe has the pleasure to dishonorably discharge him from the Hellfish unit. Private, you are dismissed. And while they don't get to keep the priceless paintings, Bart and Abe do share some very sweet moments at the end. It's not just his grandson that he's impressing either, Abe still has a way with the ladies. Such as the sweet Beatrice Simmons in Old Money, where she passed away tragically whilst Grandpa was away, leaving Abe an inheritance of $106,000, which he then donates to the retirement home. Dignity's on me, friends. It seems that the Simpsons men really have a thing for the Bouvier ladies, as he and Selma of all people got together, much to Homer's annoyance. A bear is eating my father! I'm Selma. A talking bear is eating my father! The two start dating, and it's not too long before Abe pops the question. They get married and for a little while the two are very happy, but they soon realise that the age gap between them is too large and they break up amicably. And before this, he even wooed Marge's mother with some dancing potatoes. <laughs> Abe was sweet on Jacqueline and the two made an adorable pair. The two go out dancing, but surprise, surprise, who's there to ruin Abe's day but Monty Burns, stealing his girl away and sticking a diamond ring on her finger. But luckily, on the wedding day, Jackie saw sense, running away with Abe, albeit not romantically, on an escape bus. It seems that whether it's a fight over Nazi gold, dog bites, or the ladies, Mr. Burns has always been the constant thorn in Abe's behind, always there to ruin his day, even causing Mona Simpson to leave her family behind. But she would come back later again in the present day, and naughty Abe still tried to reignite this old flame, which failed. Can we have sex, please? Oh. <laughs> well, I tried. What's for supper? Despite this and his turbulent relationship with Homer, the two have shared some very sweet moments together, which we'll explore more in his future. Abe's Future As shown in Barthood, as a teenager, Bart goes to Grandpa's grave to pay his respects. All done and dusted for Grandpa, right? Turns out the lying deep within the soil holds Springfield's cryogenic facility, storing many of Springfield's most fragile residents. 
Homer had a frozen in order to prevent a disease from killing him, and it's much cheaper than a nursing home. And it seems as though he's in this facility for quite a few decades, so much so that he's in it from when Bart's a teenager till when he's raising his own kids as a dad. And it seems that Bart is having quite a few issues with his sons, a current correlation between Homer and Grandpa, Homer and Bart, and now Bart with his own kids. Homer visits Grandpa with Bart's disgruntled kids, almost as a lesson to show how Homer and Grandpa still have their troubles. But when you get older, you realize how much you love them. But ultimately, they are father and son and love each other very much. Oh, I love you, Dad. It seems that throughout their lives, Grandpa and Homer really have got over the huge hump that was years and years of heartache. And quite honestly, a lot of friction a lot of us have with our own parents. And it was nice seeing Homer defrost Grandpa for a good old Christmas knees up. And that's as far as we know so far. Luckily, we haven't heard him passing away just yet, so don't expect him to do so anytime soon. Come on, Grandpa, just a few more years. I'd love to give a huge shout out to The Real Jims and his awesome video focusing on the marvel that is Grandpa's past. I've linked it in the description for you guys to watch. It's got some great analysis, and I always love listening to his takes on the show. And finally, I'd like to say a big thank you to my newest Flying Hellfish member, Reese Spear. And a big thank you to my other Flying Hellfish members. We have Timothy, One Drummer Boy, Steve, Sean, Stefan, Robert, Glenford, Devin, Gadrak, Stephen, Edward, Anthony, Nicola, Jeffrey, Abby, Dominic, Cody, Chaz, Jeff, Gil, Shadu, Murray, Paul, Henry, Frank, Lucas, Omer, Eric, Thomas, 88, Samantha, Rayleigh, Laurent, Brendan, Shavendra, Holly, Jason, Molly, Doug, David, Rachel, and Valerie.